Hello and welcome to episode two of the Sony Pro Show with myself, Hersha Patel, and panellists Toby Lockerbie and Stefan Knight. If you haven't already joined us, then where have you been? And welcome. We are broadcasting to you from the Sony Technology Centre here at Pinewood Studios in England, and we'll be featuring some of Sony's newest and most exciting cameras boasting large format sensors and an incredible dynamic range. From the traditional to the emerging self-shooter, we want to appeal to all of you. And if you think your friends and colleagues could benefit from the show, then please do encourage them to subscribe. Now, before we get into things, here's a shot of me on location demonstrating the two-step S-Log workflow, which is what we're going to talk about in today's show. Hi guys, welcome back to the studio. Hello. How are you doing? Been busy? Filming. Always busy. Obviously, <laughs> filming, filming. So today we are going to talk about the evolution of grading workflow. Toby, what are your thoughts on this? Grading and sort of how cameras have been recording uh, and how we sort of work with those files has changed quite a lot over the last few years. Right. Originally, cameras didn't have that much dynamic range and the TVs and monitors that we'd play them play the sort of footage on didn't have that much dynamic range. And just uh, quickly, dynamic range, that is yeah, it's the, the quality sort of, of the image? Or? It's, the, it's the, the sort of difference between the, the blackest blacks and the brightest right. whites. Right, yeah. So if you have a camera that doesn't have that much dynamic range and you're filming indoors with the lights off and it's a bright day outside, you kind of have to choose, One is your indoor going to be... Exposed bright correctly, yeah. and your your window completely blown out white or do you expose for the window so you can see the trees outside but then everything is really dark inside right. so high dynamic range cameras can kind of capture a bit of both and it's a nice. sort of sort of filmic type look yeah and sort of the old cameras they couldn't do that yeah really and you'd have a kind of one-step process where you would film and then deliver and you didn't have many options to be able to creatively grade things, right. change the colors. Yeah. But n more modern cameras have sort of, can shoot in log and they can shoot in raw. And so they are bigger sensors as well and they can capture a wider dynamic range. Yeah. And the so problem- more to play with. Yeah, you have yeah. more to play with, exactly. And so that's, there's a sort of double-edged sword to that because it's really good because it gives you great creative options. Yes. You can take this log file, which has all this information in mm -hmm. it. All, you know, it can keep the highlights, it can reveal the detail in the shadows, but it's, you've got this sort of file that you need to then put energy into it. You need to grade, oh, yeah. you need to add LUTs, you need to do something to increase contrast, to up the saturation, to get it to look correct, yeah. to get it to look normal and real and where you sort of want it to be. And that becomes a two-step process. And so that's becoming sort of more complex. It, it, it gives you better options for grading. And everyone wants, the, you know, the final image to look as good as possible. And if it's a really high-end shoot, then you've got this professional colorist who's yeah. doing all of this, you know, magic to it. They're really working on getting the color and the image to where you want it to be. But then also you might be doing an event shoot or you might be doing something or, else and people, you know, the client yeah. still wants it to look really good, yeah. but they might have a really fast turnaround. They might not have money for a colorist. And so there's this kind of extra step that's been put in, mm -hmm. which gives amazing creative options for a sort of more filmic, lovely image, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it also adds work to you it if does. you're doing the editing. Especially if you're not a colorist, which, you know, exactly, I'm, yeah. I'm always in that situation where I'm coloring my own footage, either for a client or for myself. Yeah. And I, and I start it and then put it down, look at it the next day and everything looks green and awful. And then I spend yeah, another three I've hours trying yeah. to, you know, and it's like, ah, but having said that, it's great having the option to grade your own yeah. footage because you can completely change the feel yeah. and look and really brings the and tone. Back to life. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it's a brilliant option, but also, it, like you said, a double-edged sword of, yeah. of there's a lot of possibility there. It's never might. ending, isn't it, the grading process, yeah. right? Like, you, you can spend hours and hours in the edit trying to make an image to look the way you want it to look, um, but then time is money, really, so you, you might only have one day to, to grade, um, but you actually need three, and then you're just stuck there uh, having to make decisions, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think as filmmakers, we want our images to look as good as possible. Yeah. If we're delivering something to a client, we want it to look great. 
But then if you're delivering a log file to a client and they look at it and they're thinking, you know, either what is this or yeah. how come everyone else's footage is what really colorful you and yours is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so it's a sort of, you have maybe have to explain it to clients or you're trying to do the grading before you hand it off to them. Yeah. Or you shoot in a one-step process, but you shoot in Rec 709, which is called, which is sort of less dynamic range. It looks really colorful. You can give it straight to the client but you're losing some of that filmic look to yeah, it. Probably. And the client might then come back and say, I want it to look in a different way. Yeah. And then yeah. you don't have the options you in post that. to change things so much because right. it's kind of been baked into the file. Oh, right. So Rec 709 is baked in yeah. and there's no there's options no once yeah. You've, yeah. you've made that commitment. Yeah, you can shoot with, I mean, all, all these cameras here shoot to lots of different picture profiles and you can tweak them yourself yeah. and they, you can make them so they're really colourful and perfect to just hand to a client, mm -hmm. but they won't have the same dynamic range as a log file and so you might have windows blowing out or you might not see into the shadows as much and that, that might not matter it might be okay it might be a kind of scene that you can do that with but it's if you want the soup the, the the best image possible you probably want to shoot log and then you want and to grade it, it. And it but yeah do you know so what complex. the i've been told this before when directing shoots and sort of saying can we just shoot it shoot it with a you know exactly. more of a color on it yeah. and and sort of so i don't have to mess around with it in the mm. edit but um actually you're right it's it's the image quality that you want isn't it yeah. so but i mean um things are kind of easier with that two-step process nowadays because of uh, LUTs for a lot of people. A lot of right. people like LUTs and they have specific... You yeah, use LUTs, I use LUTs all the time. Uh, LUTs are called lookup tables. They're essentially presets which you can just drop on a clip and it can give you a filmic look uh, so in different styles. In once, you, once you're in the edit, so you film your content. You could even load LUTs onto external monitors as well, which then say the directors on set looking at the monitor, they can see the image in, with a LUT applied, uh, which will give you them a... Uh, you know, an image yeah. of what it might look like uh, right. at final delivery. Yeah. I can then extract that same lot and use that same exact lot if they really liked it on set yeah. in, in the edit and then tweak it as I, as I go. Um, lots can be created by colorists, they can be created by directors. Um, you can use, you can make them in different softwares um, or you can buy them in bundles as well, as well yeah. which is what I do. So that's yeah, really they're, handy. They're cool. They're sort of, they're non-destructive non presets that you can drop onto that's your right. footage yeah. to give it a kind of look. Yeah. You don't have to use it. You don't, you can make your own LUTs or you can just, I don't actually use LUTs that much. I tend to, you know, look at the, look at the files and look at the waveform and I adjust the levels yeah. and using curves and I try and sort of white balance and then I, you know, I sort of correct the image mm -hmm. yeah. and then I, put the sort of creative look to it. So you're, the way you colour something is you correct the white balance and everything first, yeah. and then you put the creative in. I correct it to sort of give it the right dynamic range, the sort of waveform to fit in yeah. correctly, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, because it could be a really low dynamic range scene, and so you right. kind of want to stretch it out yeah. so that it's still, you know, contrasty. The blacks still look black, they yeah. don't look grey, yeah. and the whites look white, so they don't look light grey. A lot is not... Uh, so you, there's no perfect LUT, is there? there there's is no, no like you can't just drop it on and go, well, that's, that's sorted it, it out. Yeah. You kind of often have to fi <laughs> fix it slightly. Yeah, <laughs> there's always tweaking. Yeah, there's a lot of tweaking. Yeah, sort of fi you fix and tweak is kind of how I often do it. Yeah, and if it's not there in the file, then then you need a CGI and a professional colorist probably to fix it. You know, <laughs> well, so you really need to <laughs> you need to try and get it right in you know in camera first of all, and then uh, the the colouring is more tweaking, really. So, Stefan, if money was no object, what would you do? If money was no object, I would shoot raw, everything raw. And, that, and then I would probably hire an editor, a colourist, which he, he can then spend all the time in the world to do all the grading he can, uh, or he wants to do. But that or is, she. Or she. <laughs> he or she, sorry. Uh, but that isn't the case in the real world. Uh, we have budget constraints, we have um, time constraints as well which result in having to shoot in different colour profiles. But what about Sony's hybrid log gamma firmware update? How does that fit into the work or how does that affect the workflow? Yeah, so uh, Sony's hybrid log gamma firmware update is, it kind of, it brings things back to a one step uh, process, right. like how a lot of people used to do things and how some people still like doing things. And that one step process is, you know, when you shoot with a sort of contrasty, uh, profile like a Rec 709 profile, and then you deliver in exactly the same way, but you tend to like blow out highlights. It doesn't have yeah. the, as much dynamic range. Right. The hybrid in. log gamma is a bit like that, but it retains the highlights and it retains the uh, shadows. So it's a bit like log, but right. it's kind. It's like a sort of graded log, 
And so okay. it's it's like a deliverable format that still has all the dynamic range of well of log. So if I was to shoot with hybrid log gamma, yeah, and I decide and I edited my work and yeah. I decided I didn't like the grade, yeah, would I still have all the information there to change it or? Yes, sort of. Unlike I, the burnt in ex definitely, previous example, definitely. if right. you shoot in Rec seven hundred nine you've got like an image baked in and there's right. not much you can do you can't pull back highlights yeah if you shoot in log you're shooting in the best possible format it retains as much de detail as possible as much dynamic range as possible yeah. similar to raw mm -hmm. um and so you can do as much manipulating as possible but right. it requires that manipulating process yeah. hybrid log gamma being a sort of hybrid is yeah. kind of in between the two and that it it's a deliverable format but it still has the dynamic range in it so to it still has the highlights yeah so you, you can do some creative control you can do some grading to it yeah. but it's also in a form that you can deliver straight away and the client can look at it and it it will look colorful it will look sort of vibrant. it will look correct yeah. it will look vibrant yeah and then when it comes to sort of fast turnaround which you know you experience a lot of festivals probably mm -hmm. or high volume of work when i'm making yeah. my uh YouTube videos, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I, I don't want to spend hours editing yeah, yeah. day in, day out. Yeah. So this sounds like a perfect solution. Because people miss that sort of shooting and delivering a file straight away that's kind of been taken away with log. It's a really good compromise between the two yeah. because it retains that dynamic range, but it still, it still looks, yeah. you know, vibrant and colorful. Yeah, it still looks yeah. like a finished file and also has the added benefit of those files will work, they'll play on normal TVs, but they'll also play on high dynamic range TVs, which mm -hmm. are kind of right. starting so to arrive. Is it future-proofing? Yeah, it is that in a way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you shoot on log, you've got a kind of future-proof file, yeah. but you need to grade it to give the final file. Yeah. So you kind of need to turn the log into hybrid gamma log right. just to deliver it to a HDR Compatible monitor or TV yeah, yeah, yeah. in the future, you know, yeah. and so... It is a really nice in between the two, yeah. so it's a it's a really good little sort of firmware addition. So, is this firmware update available on all of the Sony cameras? I believe it's available on the Z one hundred and fifty and the FS five right over here. Yeah. Oh, the good old FS five. This is the little one of my favourites. Yeah. <laughs> so, what are some of the other new features on the latest firmware update? Uh, well, one of my favourite features on the new firmware is that the ISO, the base ISO on the FS five when shooting S log two, has gone down from three thousand two hundred to two thousand. And that just allows for the image to have less grain um, and be, uh, have the image will be less brighter, which then allows me to then open up the, the iris. And yeah, and that makes it easier in the edit for me. Um, and then I think another update is the continuous slow-mo. Yeah, um, so, I think that segues nicely to me because I like slow motion a lot. Yeah. You do. Um, we talked about that in the last yeah, show. Yeah, I did. In the last show, I talked about how good having a buffered slow motion yeah. was with like an end, end trigger. trigger. Yeah. Uh, super useful for filming events that you're not, easily in control of. And the new update uh, also has an update to the slow motion in that you can record continuous 120 frames a second before you can wow. only do 60. Yeah. So it's not quite as fast as the 240 frames buffered, mm -hmm. but 120 frames are still super slow motion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as much as having buffered is awesome yeah. and super useful and relevant for some situations where you can't control your waiting for a particular moment, yeah. Um, like action, exactly. sports, yeah. Exactly, but there are also moments, well, part of the problem with buffered, as useful as it is, is when you hit the, the record button, it then needs to record it. And so your camera's slightly out of action yeah. for, you know, 10 that, seconds or yeah, something in, like in that. In that time, you can't film anything practical. else. You have to wait yeah. until it's yeah, finished. Yeah. Yeah. And so, for yeah. instance, just to give an example, if you're filming a wedding and you're filming the confetti shot and you want to film it all in super slow motion, yeah. what do you do? Do you film eight seconds of it or do you film it in just normal slow motion this sort of up, this update here means that because you can film continuously you can you can film for, in 120 frames a second continuously for 3 until minutes or something card. like that yeah. until you fill your card uninterrupted so, capturing yeah. so, filling the card up <laughs> yeah exactly so it's the best of both worlds you can choose to have super slow motion continuously or yeah. you can have it buffered mm -hmm. and uh, that's really useful and i don't know any other camera that can do that so that's that is i i agree that's really useful how often do the firmware updates come about? Is it quite regularly? Um, I mean, different man manufacturers do yeah, different things. Yeah. Uh, you often firmware updates for manufacturers are to fix bugs, right. and so it's really as a sort of consumer who owns Sony kits, 
and uh, it's it's nice to see firmware updates that add new features. Well, yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's really nice. Yeah. To, you know, your camera's sort of growing after you've bought it yes. rather than yeah, losing exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know. Value, yeah, it yeah, does, you're and it does. Up. Yeah, it adds value to it, and it sort yeah. of makes you want to stick with it. So, uh, yeah, it's always nice to see you know firmware updates that include features, not just uh, bug okay. fixes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've talked a bit about the FS5. Let's talk a bit more about the FS7 now and how the two cameras compare and what are the qualities of the FS7 that make it really stand out? So it's funny you say that, because I'm actually pretty, I'm, I'm thinking of upgrading my FS5 to the FS7 Mark II. Uh, okay. One of the main reasons because the FS5 shoots 8-bit uh, Audio HD, yeah. um, whereas the FS7 Mark II shoots 4K DCI at 10-bit, 422. Uh, and that's a full 4K compared to Audio HD, which is which 3840. Is, is that it's an extra 50 or 60 pixels, wider. yeah, slightly wider. I believe it's a 17 by 9 aspect ratio instead of 16 by 9 on the FS5. Right. Um, that's one of my main features, uh, favorite features of the FS7 Mark II. Also, uh, slow mo, I'm sorry, I'm going to take that away from you. I love the continuous slow mo on this guy. <laughs> 108, up to 180 frames, continuous slow mo, uh, no buffering whatsoever, which is great. Yeah. Um, economically, I kind of prefer it because I, I do a lot of shoulder rig work as well. And um, with the FS5, you have to buy some sort of third-party rig. Uh, and it's more of, it's made, I guess the FS5 is made for documentary work, shooting from the hip. Whereas on the FS7, you can shoot from the hip if so, but or you can rotate Pretty the high. handle and put it on your shoulder. Yeah. Just like we uh, talked versatile. about in the other episode. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's more versatile. Yeah, I'm trying to think it's got a, um, a lever locking mechanism on the front. Uh, it's an E-mount lever locking mechanism, which means uh, the original... Well, E-mount e yeah, e yeah. is was sort of originally designed just for stills lenses. Uh, and this locking mechanism means that you can sort of more comfortably put bigger, heavier lenses on, like cinema so lenses. it's more or, solid. Or, yeah, it's more yeah. solid. It's, uh, so you don't have to put rails in there. Like, uh, yeah, and so it's a bit more like a sort of cinema camera that way. And in general, the FS7 is is the sort of cinema bigger brother to the FS5. Yeah. So this right. is a bit more geared up for run and gun kind of shooting. Yeah. And it's, it's very sort of low profile. You can break it down. You can use it a bit like a stills camera or like a medium format yeah, camera. Yeah. The FS7 is a bit more sort of geared up for shoulder mounted you can put it on a ronin yes you can yeah. um i mean if you're rigging it up massively it's already going to be quite heavy so you're probably going to need a some sort system, of like, easy yeah. rig, like a support system yeah, yeah. To use that so probably. there isn't a huge at that point you could shoot with one or the other the, yeah. the weight difference doesn't mean as much not at all um, another great feature is the ability to be able to load up to four 3d lots on there uh, right. so instead of when you're shooting in cine cine ei mode and shooting on s log three you can load some LUTs on there, which uh, give you a representation of what your image would look like. So it doesn't bake in the image, the, the grade essentially. It just shows you on the preview there, so you can expose your image correctly. So you've got the FS5 does Gamma Assist, which is a, say, yeah. is a similar thing, but it's, it's just Gamma Assist. And so it's just their kind of version of what it might look like. Right. Whereas if you, you know, we were talking about LUTs earlier. If yeah. you have a particular LUT that you, you use a lot, mm -hmm. if you have a particular sort of style or a LUT that you've put together yourself or bought from a director or a director of photography yeah. or something like that mm -hmm. and you often use that when you're editing it's nice to be able to just load it in yourself and, yeah and show it you yeah. might have one that you tend to use in sort of darker lower light surroundings and right. one that you use when it's sort of really bright or something like that yeah. that you've sort of tested over time this is the one i always drop on when it's a really you know sort of high key scene and this is the one i i do when it's a really you know, underexposed shot or something yeah, like that. Absolutely. And yeah. then you can flick between them and you kind of know what it's going to look like before you've edited. So, and it's, so in that way, it also speeds up your editing process a little bit. So that's a wrap for today. Thanks guys very much for joining me and thank you for joining me. Hope you gained some valuable insight. See you guys again soon. Please do subscribe.